Good morning, Family Church. Thank you. It's nice to see you, too. For those of you that said good morning. The rest of y'all, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. (laughs) All right. How y'all feeling this morning? (laughs) They're about to be. Okay, uh, if you're new here, I am uh, Pastor Jared. I still feel weird to say. Uh, I'm Jared. I don't like titles. I don't like titles. Y'all can say it. I'm not, I, I don't, I, yeah, okay, I'll put it on the screen. All right. Um, today is a little different. Um, and I have to pour my heart out to you before we get into this word and unpack it. Because um, I want you to know where I'm coming from. <laughs> it's already heavy. I want you to know everything that comes out today is, uh, I feel pregnant. And I don't mean that as a disrespect towards women. I feel pregnant. I feel like this is going to birth something. Um, and I'm not trying to like preface this like to you know, get whatever, sympathy or I don't even know what you would give. I just want you to know my heart, um, where this is coming from. Uh, you, can, you can ask Kelsey, I struggled this week with this message. Um, I knew where I wanted to go, and God said, no, <laughs> take it back here. Um, okay, first things first, I'm sorry, I'm working it out, I'm working it out. Um, I want us, th- this week, I'm going to start a series. The series is called Committed, Committed. Uh, this week will be week one. I'm calling it renewal. If you want to know where we are, if you want to turn your Bibles in there, I'm not going to have you stand up today. I just want to read the word over you. Uh, we're going to be in Second Chronicles 17. Next week will be in 18. That will be relapse. The third week will be 19. And I forget the title, but we'll get there. It's another R word. Rebuke. There it is. <laughs> it sounds so heavy. The, the, yeah, the, the third week will be um, rebuke and revival. The fourth week will be 20. That is where I initially wanted to start. Um, for those of you on the teams, if you're here in the team huddle uh, at 920, uh, I think it was two weeks ago when I preached um, the, the Daniel and the Lion's Den sermon. In the team huddle, he, my dad read uh, 2 Chronicles 20. And that was the message I had originally started out to preach that day, and then God shifted me to Daniel. Uh, And so I went back to study that passage, and if you look, the first verse in uh, chapter 20 says, after this. So being a student of the text, as we all should be, you have to ask the question, after what? What is going on? So I had to go back. And I went back, and I went to 16, started at 16, and then went forward slowly, and this week, uh, I struggled greatly because there was so much here, but I didn't know how to put it here to connect with you. Um, so this week, I didn't bring my iPad. I don't, I don't know how this is going to come out, and it's not that I am not prepared. It's just that um, I am being repaired. Uh, I truly feel like God is, um, and I have prayed for this, and it is, Mitch, you said it last night, it is a dangerous prayer for God to break you. Uh, It is also the most beautiful thing (laughs) that you can ask God to do. And it hurts, but it's healing. And it's what we need. So this week, renewal, um, I I just want to lay a foundation. But I want to preface this before I go, and I know this is making it like, (laughs) we just got out of worship, and I feel like I'm bringing the energy way down here. But I want you to know my heart is not um, angry. I'm not angry with the church. Uh, I, I feel like I have a little bit of righteous agitation, if you will, um, with the, not necessarily here. So if, if I say, and if you're new here, this is not how it normally is, I promise you. <laughs> but this is how it is on me today. Uh, I, I cried all this week. Kelsey was asleep last night, and I was just weeping beside her because of this message. Whew. It is heavy on me. But it is important, and I believe it is something that we need so greatly. Um, 
So I want you to know, when I say things like you or we, I'm not speaking to this house in uh, specific, but in the generality of the Christian culture that is in America. Um, And not to get ahead, but this weak, disgusting, woke, lukewarm Christian culture that is in America. It's disturbing. I am... I'm not angry. I am angry, but I'm, I'm more agitated because we don't, we don't, we're not grasping the gravity of this. We're not. We're not. We're not. I, I know because we, and you know what? Let's just get in the text. There's a lot. Committed, week one, renewal. Oh, this feels so weird. I feel like I'm just, oh, it's a burden. Again, I, I, I typed out 6,000 words, and I threw that all away, and I've got two sheets of paper here just on the front, not even front and back. I want to speak to you today from my heart. I am stepping out, and I, I am fully believing that the Holy Spirit is going to meet me and tell us what we need to hear. Um, if this breaks you, know that it, it broke me first. What has to come to you guys has to go through us first. When we stand up here and preach to you, it has to come to us. And a lot of times, the messages we bring, it's like we're, we're limping to the pulpit to try to tell you what's going on. And it is such a strange calling because we're just as human as you are and, and you think that we come up here and our family's got it all together and we don't get angry and we don't have uh, bitterness or resentment or anything like that. We deal with the same things that you deal with. So sometimes it's like a, 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 this weird hypocritical feeling of I'm, I'm bringing this to you, but I'm still dealing with it. Does that make sense? Okay, all I ask you this morning, (laughs) not for uh, a pity party party or or sympathy, but this is a dialogue. I don't like, I called it a monologue last time for some reason. I went back and watched it. Um, It's a dialogue. I I want to, uh, for us to converse. Um, If you don't know this, speaking to you and reading the word of God and preaching the word of God, this, this is worship. To him. You listening to this and letting it saturate your soul is worship to him. And when we converse back and forth instead of you just looking at me to fill your plate and eat the food for you, when you meet me in the middle and meet him in the middle, when you meet any pastor in the middle and converse with them, it's like a dance and we enter into the throne room together. So don't be quiet. If you're a raised Baptist, that's going to sound so awkward. But I I just, I have to pour my heart out to you. I want you to know I'm not angry at you. I don't want this to be or feel like a rebuke. Um, and, And I know that's like, I feel like I'm like gearing up to rebuke you. I'm not doing that. And I also, for the internet, who's probably going to clip this up, I'm not apologizing for this. Okay, there's a lot of pastors that will spend 10 minutes telling you they're sorry for convicting you of your sin. I'm not doing that, period. That's not gonna happen. We are, we are called and we are chosen. And, and, and what we do in this life sets us up for eternity. I don't think we really grasp that. I know that we come in here and we get mad if I go 20 minutes over how long I normally go. An hour, an hour and a half. Listen, an hour and 45 minutes. Y'all go to a black church. That's the introduction, okay? Y'all don't know 30-minute praise, praise parties with the circus beat and everybody just shouting down. And speaking of that, if you can play an organ, by God, I need somebody up here backing me up. I love it. Okay. Does that make, do you understand where I'm coming from? This is heavy on me, and I just, I need to tell you beforehand, this is a foundation. And if you already hate the way that I preach, don't come for the next four weeks, okay? But if, if you are truly dedicated and devoted and committed to God, 
This will feed you. It is feeding me. It will feed us. It will bring us into a better place than where we are now. Let's go. Okay. All right. I'm glad you, I'm, you know what? It's a good thing to be in this house. All right. Second Chronicles said, you know what? Here, I'm going to give you, no. I told you, I don't have my notes. At the top, I have, let the Holy Spirit speak. Chapter 17, starting in verse 1. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Jehoshaphat, his son, succeeded him as king and strengthened himself against Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and put garrisons in Judah and in the towns of Ephraim that his father Asa had captured. The Lord... (laughs) <laughs> the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. If, you, if you're pregnant right now, that is a name that nobody's picking. So if you want a unique name, Hillary Jehoshaphat, it ain't taken. There's some other words in here. If you don't want them, Shemiramoth, uh, Shemima, you know, any of those. They're all good biblical names. The Lord was <laughs> with Jehoshaphat. Because he followed the ways of his father, David. I want you to, to understand what I just said. The previous verse, his father Asa. But the Lord was with him because he followed the ways of his father, David. Asa was his physical father, but he was a descendant of David. That's important. Pack that away. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control. Oh, God. The Lord established the kingdom under his control. And all Judah, all Judah brought gifts so that he had great wealth and honor. And we're all stopped for today, or for now, not today. Verse six, his heart was devoted. I believe the NLT NLT says committed. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. Mm. Let's pray. Father, we, we feel you. You know what? Before I pray, let, let's do this. Um, I'm, I'm going to say something in the prayer, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. If you are not ready for it, when we close our eyes, go and leave. Listen. Listen to my heart. Leave. Come back later. Watch it later. If you are not ready, that's Okay. If someone gets up and leaves in this message, do not judge them for not being as ready as you might be. Okay? I know we get so wrapped up in the stories of our own lives that we forget that each and every one of you, if you look around in this room, every single person has a different story that they are walking out and living. They all have different problems. They all have different blessings. All of you are going through something, walking through something, and it's so easy to just get in the mindset of this is where we are. Society is just wanting to focus on ourselves. Every car you pass on the highway, that's a person. That's a person. A person with a life, with family, with friends, Maybe kids, maybe a husband, maybe a wife, a person. If you are not ready to go deeper, I don't, we don't judge you. We don't judge you. If you are a new believer, like I said, or a new person coming here, or maybe you don't believe in Jesus, again, this is not how I normally am. This is not how it normally is here. 
Um, but first and foremost, if you are here, you belong before you believe. So even if you are an atheist in this building and you think this is all just a bunch of crap, you belong. You belong. You are in the right place. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. Heavenly Father, bless us by breaking us. Break off what needs to get broken off. We are headed towards a breakthrough, but things have to be broken off before we get there. We need renewal. We need revival. But it's, we keep praying for revival, Father, and we, we expect it to just start, but we need it to start in us and leak out. Father, I am your vessel. Speak through me. Hijack this whole service, Holy Spirit. Let your word not return void and pour out into us so when we go back out, we can pour that out into someone else. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Renewal. Renewal. Okay. Jehoshaphat, his son, Asa's son. Jehoshaphat, his son. Remember, that name is not taken. Asa, if you look, hey, it's, oh, never mind. That was somebody else. Okay. If you look at Asa, he started out good. But if you read the end of his story, he kind of fell apart. That is why uh, in verse 3 it says that Jehoshaphat followed the ways of his father David. And in verse 1, it says that he is strengthening himself against Israel because Israel was a complete nation. And then in 930 BC, it split. And 10 of the tribes went with with, uh, Jeroboam to the north and Rehoboam, I don't know, Rehoboam, Rehoboam, whatever, I'm English. (sighs) The other son... Stayed south. He, he stayed the king of... Act like y'all can't say the names in the Old Testament. Don't judge me. <laughs> y'all like, ah, that was good, Lord. <laughs> Jeroboam goes to the north. They, they, they basically split. And this is like nutshell, thousand foot view. 930 BC, they split. Jeroboam goes to the north. Uh, they disagree on religious practices. If you follow the story through Kings and Chronicles, you'll see... There was no good kings in the north. Okay, this is not the Starks. This is not Eddard Stark with, you know, great honor and and all that stuff. There was nothing in the north. When Jeroboam went there and they split, he established two golden calves. You remember this from Exodus, the golden calf worship. Jeroboam establishes two golden calves for worship, effectively bringing pagan ideas and worship into the north. And in the south, in Judah, not that they were perfect, but they, they, they tried their best to stay committed to God. And obviously, on both sides, as humans do, we all fall short. We all fall short. So while Judah tried to stay faithful to the Lord, they still stumbled and they still fell. And it's so easy. We read the Bible and we're like, how did you guys do this? How did you do this? We go through Exodus and God literally with all of the plagues and all the signs and wonders that he did in Egypt when he brings the people out and then splits the sea in front of them and they have a, a, cloud by, or, uh, yeah, a cloud by day and a fire by night. They have visible signs and evidence of God and their hearts still go far from him afterwards. Because they, it's like it's, it's so, it should be so easy and so simple, but we want more. We want something else. We want something else. We want what everyone else has. So they they, they get to the point that they're instituting and synchronizing themselves and their practices with the Canaanites and all the false religions. And so they are at war. There's constant conflict since 930 BC. This is why he's strengthening, strengthening himself against them. And Asa was good. And eventually, um, he does something stupid, as we normally do, 
And Hannah and I, a seer, basically like a, a, a mouthpiece for God, prophet type person, he rebukes him. He gets mad. He gets mad at the rebuke, like we do. When the pastor says, you've got to stop doing this. This is leading you into sin. This is leading you into death. This is not setting you apart from God. This is putting you on the path for destruction. We get mad. Don't judge me. Don't talk about that. Don't point that out. And he, rebu- he gets mad at the rebuke and has him beaten. And Jehoshaphat, his son, has seen this. And and you'll see in a few weeks, but just to give you a glimpse, the same thing happens. Asa allies himself with with someone in uh, apostasy. Jehoshaphat ends up, next chapter, next week, he aligns himself with Ahab. Does anybody know Ahab? Ahab and Jezebel. Terrible person. (laughs) He aligns himself with Ahab in a war that only Ahab wanted. They did not seek God. And I don't want to, you know, go into all next week too much. But when he comes back home after Ahab dies, he gets rebuked. That's chapter 19. But he has, and and this is the, the fun fact, is you have Asa who gets rebuked by Hanani. And then you have Jehoshaphat, his son, gets rebuked by Hanani's son, Jehu. Continuing the cycle. But he reacts completely different. And we will see that in a few weeks. We will see that in a few weeks. But the, 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 the thing is, and what you need to understand, is there any parents in the room here? Raise your hands. Be proud. Don't be scared that you have kids. Amen. There we go. They are watching you. Okay? They are watching you. Your voice will become their inner voice. So when we are constantly yelling at our kids, that is what shapes their mind and their inner thoughts. That's why so many people, when they think about God, they have this view that God is an angry person because they probably had an angry father. And it sounds funny, but it's true. If your father was angry or your father was distant or your father wasn't there for your entire life or he abandoned your family, Your view of God has already been twisted that he is angry, that he is abandoning you, or that he will not be there when you need him. That is the lies of the enemy, period. God is always there. You cannot, I know we say, oh, they're far from God. Their hearts might be. But God, when they turn around, when you turn around and you make a life change, he is directly right there to scoop you back up into his arms. The story of the prodigal son, he goes running after the prodigal. So they're, they're, they're watching you, and you see how Asa, and I'm not saying Jehoshaphat is perfect because he did this much of the same uh, things, and he fell into the same kind of ways. But it is up to you parents to be the breakers of that general, generational curse. It is up to you. And I know it's hard. If you're dealing, excuse me, with addiction or with lust or with bitterness or with brokenness, whatever generational curse is against you, I know it's hard. That's why your dad struggled with it. That might be why they didn't talk to you about it. Because... It might have been worse for them with their father. And they wanted to break it off for you. And in Exodus 20, we we know that uh, God is a jealous God. And that it says he punishes children for the parents' sin to the third and fourth generation. Do you know the rest of the verse? But for those who love them, he blesses a, a thousand generations the importance of what you are doing. The importance of what you are doing. Coming to church, reading your Bible in front of them, standing for God, praying at the dinner table, letting them come in and see you kneeling at your bed and praying to God, interceding for them, laying hands on them. They are watching you. They are watching you. And it's so hard not to get ahead.
They are, they are watching everything you do. So what you deal with, how you react to it, how you talk to them is going to shape how they walk through this life, how they think of themselves. And we know the Bible says, train up a child in the way so that then we're, they, when they are old, they will not depart. But as Christians, we get it in our minds that all of a sudden we want the kids to always stay on the straight and narrow. So we try to whip them into submission and control every outcome of their life instead of guiding them like God guides us, giving them the tools necessary so the seeds get planted. And when it's time for the harvest to come, it springs up. But instead, we want to beat them over the head and try to control them and stop them from sinning as if we have stopped. And so he watches Asa, his father. And your kids watch you and they see... It's itchy. They see what he did. They see what he does. Jehoshaphat sees what he did. And he's like, you, 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 know, you did some good and you fell away. But I, I don't want to follow that pattern. And I watched you come home and drink every night. I don't want to follow that pattern. I watched you beat mom because you were such a bitter drunk. I don't want to follow that pattern. I watched you come home angry from work and get on your phone. I don't want to follow that pattern. Do you see the importance? You can, oh, oh, oh help me, Holy Spirit. You can break a, gener a generational curse or you can be building one. You can be building one because you, <laughs> you're so self-centered. You know, oh, just, and hey, I am guilty of this myself. Go work a 12-hour, 16-hour shift. You come home. You don't want nothing to do with nobody. Just give me a hot meal. Let me take a cold shower and go to bed. But those little ones are running out the door to meet you. And they need you more than you need food, more than you need a shower, You've still got a job to do. It's not just the career. It's your parenthood. So he, he makes the changes and he follows. Oh, I love this. He follows his father, David, the man after God's own heart. Oh, David. Not even in the realm of an idea when Samuel comes to anoint the next king, David, a boy, a shepherd boy, anointed to be the king. Do you think he wanted it? Can you imagine, well, however old he was, eight, let's just say eight, ten, whatever. Can you imagine being a child and why is he tending sheep and all the older brothers are out doing God knows what? And, and I love it. God, Samuel, God tells Samuel, don't look at the outside. Don't look for who's tall. Don't look for who's handsome. The Bible even says Jesus wasn't handsome. Just so we, we wouldn't follow him because he looked good. And David, chosen to be a king. He didn't want this, but he did it. And you've got a calling, and you might not like it. But you will. I hated this. I would not rather do a single other thing than stand up here and talk about God with you guys. Oh, you have no idea how much this blesses me. And, and David, a man after God's own heart, David, anointed, picked as a king, and Jehoshaphat is, is following the ways of David, the man after God's own heart, <laughs> the man who committed an affair and then had the husband murder David and their son. <laughs> Y'all know the Bible. Their son dies. The sin, the sin has consequence. And the entire time leading up to it, this is not, oh, this is not, mm, the entire time leading up to it, he's weeping and mourning and interceding. And then when the day comes and the child dies, he stops. And what's, what's, even more mind-boggling 
If you think your sin is keeping you too far from God and you thinking you think your sin is a reason why he's not going to pick you, not going to choose you, not going to use you to speak to someone, not going to use you to, to share the gospel with someone, he got the prophecy about what Solomon would do before he had the affair with Bathsheba. The sin was already taken into account before the calling. Your sin, where are y'all at today? The sin was already there. God knows. And he knows your thoughts. And we think, oh man, I just messed up. Let me... And not say anything as if God can't read your thoughts. And you're trying... Has anybody seen the reel from Kelsey and I on the family room? Those of you saying no and you have no idea what I'm talking about, you are missing out on Wednesday nights when we break this stuff down. There's so much more. David, the man after God's own heart. And he follows him. He makes the change. He says, you did some good. I'm going to continue that good. I'm going to continue that good. I'm going to continue that good. I'm going to look at what you did wrong, and I'm going to try to change my life based on that. Because I don't want to be exactly like you, but you did give me a good blueprint to build on. But the Bible says he followed like David. And, and even more of a, a better newsflash for you, with Asa and Jehoshaphat, even though they allied with someone in apostasy, and, and they stumbled at the end of their walk, at the end of their life, the Bible still says that they did good in the eyes of the Lord. Your story is not your sin. Your story is not your stumbling. Your story is Christ coming down and dying for you. And who you can share it with, who you can help lift up out of the pit like he lifted you out. And the Lord, oh man, just because he did this, the Lord was with him. Just because he did that, the Lord was with him. Just because he did that. Oh man, see this is the oh. This is the problem with American churches. You're wanting three, three points in a poem. You're wanting me to stand up and shout and get everybody in the room all riled up. And you want to be entertained. Good. No. We don't want entertainment. We want to be fed meat and potatoes. We are starving for the word of God. Starving. And he didn't... Oh. He set his heart to God. He set his heart to God, and the Lord was with him. The minute you set your heart to God, he is with you. That's it. It's not, oh, I set my heart to God, and I started reading my Bible. It's not, I, I, I set my heart to God, and I started going to church. No, I, I set my heart to God, period. Not by works. Faith without works is dead, yes, but it is nothing that we have done or will do that saves us. It is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who did it all already for you. Where are you at? And he didn't consult the Baals, but sought after the God of his Father. The Baals, do you remember Baal and Asherah in 1 Kings 18? That one that we so often misread and misquote in churches because we say, oh, the 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah, they met Elijah on the mountain and he killed, you know, slit the throats of everybody. Only the prophets of Baal showed up. The other ones escaped. And he didn't consult them. And oh, I will say goodbye to YouTube and Facebook because here it comes. Apostasy. Apostasy. They, we see and we will see. They allied themselves with someone in apostasy. There's two levels if you don't know what it is. You're either falling away from the faith, synchronizing, falling away. You've got some false doctrine. Or you're completely abandoning the faith. You've, you've just, you're done. Israel, they're done. 
the northern Israel. They're done. They're fully abandoned. They're completely dedicated to the false gods. And in, in uh, Jeremiah 3.11, it's, God even says, oh my gosh, that faithless Israel is more righteous than faith, unfaithful Judah. God, oh, God would rather you be completely distant from him than to keep coming in here and sing, oh, go, hallelujah, God is not against me, and going out and putting Cardi B and Drake and Eminem and all that other garbage on your radio when you get out there. <laughs> going to the club every Friday night, every Saturday night, and then coming to church and shaking your little tambourine. We don't grasp the severity of this. I'm going somewhere with this. The, the apostasy. apostasy the, oh, man. Where we are today, in this country alone, the watered-down gospel, too afraid to conf- confront sin, too afraid to shout out the blood of Jesus, too afraid to call things what they are. And now we have... Oh my God, I don't even want to say, it's disgusting to me. Pastors and preachers wearing rainbow outfits, acting like they're reading from the holy book. This is God's holy word. And to us, it's just Exodus and Leviticus. And we skip it. It's God's holy word. There is people on the other side of the world that are translating this. And if they start, if they mess up, they start all over again. And to us, oh, it's boring. Leviticus, ah. Exodus, no, bring me into the Gospels. Put me in the New Testament. As if there's only some part of God's word that we need. Instead of the whole picture that points to the reverence and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. The watered down gospel, the compromise that we have in this country disgusting, disturbing. And what do we do? We come in here and I'll say something against it. Ah, yeah. What are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? They openly mock God in the Last Supper at the Olympics. And what do we do? We get, uh, I'm done. We get pissed off and say something on Facebook. I understand my language, but listen to me today. If that's bothering you more than the state of this country, something is wrong in your heart. They mock it. A man had his junk out. out of his underwear behind a child on national and international TV. What do we do about it? Nothing. Did any of you know that? Have you seen that? I know the whole thing about the, 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 the making fun of, and they tried to say, oh, it wasn't the Last Supper. The name in French was literally the Last Supper on whatever stupid river they were on. In French, it's open. It's open. Satan's kingdom is open. It's not hiding. It's not hiding. It is in your face, laughing at you, mocking you. What are you going to do about it? I'm not, I'm dumb. Do you notice like nobody said anything about the guy? We were all focused on that. We completely missed. This dude was exposing himself on TV. And a child, right in front of him. That's not oops. I don't want to get graphic, but you you know, okay? You know when things are not where they should be. (laughs) But that that is the reality of this, 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 this situation. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities and demons. And, and, And he didn't follow the bales. This is the thing with demons. You, you want to have your eyes open and your mind blown. The demons are non-binary. Let me, oh, let's slow down. We're human, okay? We know biology a little bit and anatomy. We've all got differing parts, okay? 
We are souls with an earthly body. That's why when you die, you still exist. And depending where you go is your choice. Blame no one but yourself for where you end up. Well, except for heaven, because it's, you know, it's Jesus, but you get what I'm saying. We have, yeah, two genders, okay? The rest is a mental illness. And with that, with that, preach, yes, and it's good, and it's a word. Pray for these people. Thank you. I'm so glad we're on the set. We don't, we don't realize we're wrestling, wrestling against flesh and blood. Let me break it down. We, we have the gender. We have the physical body. The demons are a spiritual body. They don't, they don't have a gender. Does, I hope this is starting to click in your head. Non-binary. We are binary. You've got one or the other, okay? They don't. They don't have a body. They inhabit them. They inhabit them. And we're sitting here wondering what's with people on drugs and tweaking out. And and okay, yes, they've got that physical problem. But the other problem is that they are inhabited by demons. They are prisoners of war. We are at war, not against flesh and blood, against principalities. We are at war, and half of us are standing on the sidelines wanting to kneel like Tim Tebow, thinking that's enough about doing something. We need prayer. We need prayer. But I can pray all day, Jesus, I'll make it personal. Jesus, bring my brother back to church, but if we're not inviting him, and talking to him. Non-binary. The the demons are gender fluid. They are trans because they inhabit a body. They appear different. So you're wondering what's with this whole movement. It's demons, the demonic. Satan, God creates and Satan counterfeits. He's ripping our identity out from underneath us and creating division of every kind in this country and in the world. And we dedicate a whole month to pride. The first sin, pride. And we put a whole stupid month on it. And, and, And the rainbow, Revelation 4, do you know what surrounds the throne of Jesus in heaven? A rainbow. The very thing around the throne of our Lord and Savior is now hijacked by the enemy and used as we view the cross. That's what the rainbow is now for the devil. He can't create. You said it so good last night. Everything. It's just. It's just a counterfeit. He can't make the original. Oh, but we. God called you to be who you are supposed to be. And we spend all of our time on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and YouTube comparing ourselves to everybody else who looks like they're doing good. And meanwhile, they're going home miserable as crap. And we want to be them. Why are we trying to settle for a carbon copy of someone else and being the most blessed, beautiful, original copy that God has made us? Trans, do you see, is it clicking? The trans movement. It's demons. Because you, oh, oh, we are made in the image of God. And when we worship him, we become more like God. <laughs> TikTok just kicked us off a live stream for hate speech. You see on the reels. Oh, I love it. Oh, Lord. Okay, I got to speed up. I got to speed up. I kept on an hour and 20 minutes last time. I got 17 minutes on the clock. I am nowhere. Nowhere. What was that? Oh, the, 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 uh, the trans movement. The demons. The demons were made in the image of God. 
Stay with me. We're, we're made in the image of God. And so as Christians, when we worship him, we become more like him. That is the goal, to be more like Jesus. What do you think the trans movement is? To be more like the demons, to be more like the devil, because you, you become like what you worship. You become like what you worship. So when you're worshiping yourself and you're worshiping these demons and they're leading you into being non-binary and trans or gay, God didn't make you that way. You might have, oh, you might have tendencies and you're going to have temptations. The temptation is not the sin. Acting on it is. Crucify your flesh. We become like what we worship. Let's nail it down some more. You're greedy because you worship money. You're lustful because you worship promiscuity and pornography. You're angry. You're bitter. What are we filling our heads with every day? We look at, oh man, you, the, 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 the kingdom of darkness is so on display. Are you paying attention to the music industry? Are you? Are you? What was Satan in heaven? Chief musician. Why do you think the world has such good sounding music until you get saved and you go back and listen to it and you're like, what is that? What is that? What is that? And you look at, oh man. You look at somebody like, like Lil, Lil Nas, whatever his name is, Lil Nas, the old town, country, whatever. Starts out looking good and oh, it's fun for the kids and what the JoJo, I don't know these people. I'm out of date. I'm old. I'm officially old. Have you looked at them now? Do y'all remember, uh, was it last year, a few years ago, when, when Nas Hoobadooba came out with the, the, the satanic shoe that had blood in it? Look at the music industry now, how dark it is. It's just openly dark. You go to a concert and they're literally doing, oh, it's just, it's edgy. It's just for show. It's just to look cool. It's just to get views. It's just edgy. They're doing satanic rituals in front of people. There's people going to concerts and leaving with no memory of the concert. None. It's a blank. And they're like, what is going on? You're inhabiting yourself with demons and worshiping the demonic. We come in church and we don't want to lift our hands and worship because that looks weird. But we go to a football game. Woo! Concert. Woo! Morgan Wallen. Y'all want to get real? I, I had in my well, Yeah. Okay. Do you see? What are we doing? First, first three. Like his father David. David was not perfect. He was committed. That's why he was a man after God's heart. He was committed. We are not perfect. There is no perfect church. You are in a healthy church, a healthy body, not a perfect one. Somebody's going to make you mad. Somebody's still mad. I said the P word earlier. But y'all be cussing somebody out on the way out trying to get out of this parking lot. Coming out. Act all. Oh, no, Pastor, it's all good. I just, Jesus takes everything. Oh, where did I stop? Okay. I stopped at six. I'm, I'm going to speed ahead because I don't want to take your time too much today. And I'm sorry, if you got places to be, this is it. Okay, amen. <laughs> after verse six, after he removes the high places, the, 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 in the Asherah poles, which if you didn't know, uh, was a big phallus. There's kids in here. I don't want to say the other name. It was what a man has. That was the symbol. 
These, these false gods, they would sacrifice kids to it. Disgusting. Then they're still doing it. What do you, oh man. What is the, what, they're getting ready to do the free abortions outside of wherever? They, they already did it? God help us. Listen, understand, I, I love America, but we are completely headed towards judgment if something doesn't change. And, and know this, if revival doesn't come and it's not founded on this and it's not founded on the word of God, it's going, it's going to suck for us, okay? It's going to suck. And I know somebody's like, I don't like that word. I don't care. It's going to be, you laugh. You, you don't know what's coming. Because we're, we're contained in this building. We're contained in America. Judgment. They're murdering children. And we just relabeled it. And then we look at the Bible and we, we talk about Molech and Timosh and, and all the, the, the false gods. We're like, oh, that sucks. That was, that was so gross. That was disgusting. As if it's not continuing Eve, Eve, uh, still. And we, and we label people conspiracy theorists because they'll talk about the Illuminati or something. There is no way we're on the internet right now. <laughs> Sorry, TikTok. Uh, and we, we talk. It, hmm. Satan had his demons doing this stuff back then, and we act like there's not still secret societies and stuff still doing this. Come on. Open your head, open your eyes, and realize this is what always has happened and what will continue to happen. So what he does, what he, what he does, he, he removes the high places, removes the Asherah poles, and, and, and in verse seven, he sends his officials out and he sends Levites out. I'm not reading their names. And priests. And in verse nine, I don't know if it's on the screen, they taught throughout Judah, taking with them the book of the law of the Lord. And they went around to all the towns of Judah and taught the people. They were, Judah was biblically illiterate. America is biblically illiterate. We don't study the word of God. We don't know the word of God. We don't have reverence for the word of God. It's just Exodus. It's just Leviticus. It's just the daily devotional. It's just a little uh, notification that comes up. And there's your daily verse for the day. Revival. You're good. Revival. Oh, man. Okay, verse 10. The fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands surrounding Judah so that they did not go to war against Jehoshaphat. As soon as they start teaching the word of God, it shuts them up. And it puts the fear of the Lord on people. It puts reverence on people. It puts awe of God on people. Being taught, or being taught brought trouble. For the enemies. And it brought peace. Preaching brings peace. It brings peace to you. It blesses you. It speaks life into you. And when you start studying and understanding and knowing and being taught the word of God. There's blessings. And notice Jehoshaphat never stopped. When, they, when he tore down the original stuff and they brought him the gifts, he didn't stop. He moved further and tore the poles down, tore down the high places, and then he sends people out to teach them because he knows revival will not stand if it's not built on the word of God. So while we're praying for revival, if it's not coming out of this and it's not founded on this and this is not the root of it, it's not going to stand. So pray all you want for revival, but if your life is not dedicated to the word of God, it will not stay and sustain you. And you know what happens after that? They get more blessed. Their enemies, the Philistines, even bring them gifts. 
Y'all, the, the minute you truly bury your face in this book, you are blessed. You are blessed. And that doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't have to be monetary. I know as soon as we hear the word blessed, we're like, oh, prosperity. As if, like, we're afraid of, my, well, we'll go seek it and talk about winning the lottery. But if we talk about it in church, well, there's that prosperity gospel. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about money in church. God gave it to you. Give it back to him. Oh my gosh. That he knew that, that oh, what you build on determines what can tear it down. Does that make sense? What you build on determines what, it, what, will, what can tear it down. If you are building your entire existence and your life on your reputation, on your job, on your family, on your kids, on your school, it's going to fall. You build it on your reputation. You, oh, you build it on the likes and the follows on social media. You are chained to always needing to compare yourself to someone else. You're chained to the opinions of man. Not what God says about you. Not what Jesus says about you. What can I do? Oh, how can I... How can I whore myself out more to get more people to follow me, more people to like me? Where's the OnlyFans at, huh? I can make a whole bunch of money showing everybody what I got. Where is our concern? But if you build on the word of God, what you build on determines what can tear it down. So if you build on what he says, it has the power to tear down. It has the power to tear down strongholds, to tear down apostasy, to tear down bitterness, to, pair, to tear down brokenness, to tear down depression, to tear down sin. Y'all are so stinking quiet. <laughs> to tear down shame, it can tear down. You've got to build your life on this book. Okay. I, I talked the other day. I'm going to head over to, to where are we at? Matthew 16. Can y'all just give me a little time today? I promise I'll, I'll, I'm trying to go shorter. I did not, I thought I was going to go 15 minutes because I didn't bring my notes. I appreciate it. I know I value your time. I'm sorry, but we got to work this out. It's important. We're going somewhere. There we go. I mean, what do we got to go back to anyways? We're waging, waging war. Do you understand that? We are in God's army. Do you understand that? What does that make you? All right. Amen. Now you're waking up. Wake up that warrior. Matthew 16. 13. Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Oh, man. He just, look at, oh, man. Okay, he said, who do people say? All right. The more important question was, who do you say I am? Who do you say Jesus is? And Peter, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, whoo, I will build my church. I should have used my ESV Bible because it says the gates of hell will not come against it. Will not overcome it. And we think church is supposed to be on the defensive. To stay in here and just hold up as the world tries to attack us. To shut up. Keep it within your building. Keep it within your walls. Keep it within there. We don't understand 
We're not meant to be defensive. That's why this book offends so many people because Christianity is meant to be offensive. We're supposed to be coming against the gates of hell. We're not waiting for hell to come against us. We're not trying to stand up against hell as it comes against us. We are pushing back, standing next to the gates and stopping people from going in there and saying there's a better way to live and his name is Jesus. Wage war. There's prisoners of warfare. We are supposed to be reclaiming territory from Satan's kingdom. Humans. Souls. And what do we do? I stand up in front of you oh, all the time. Go in front this building. I'm like, hey, invite somebody to church. People just want to be invited. That sounds cool, right? Why is the size not doubling every single week? If, you, if each of you told all the people you know and only one person came next week out of who you told, we would have no room. Right. Or do we not want to do that because we like the comfy seats and we don't want to take them out and sit on the floor We're waging war, and we're losing. How did I get in Ephesians? <laughs> All right. Let's wrap this up in the next 35 minutes. <laughs> I didn't know it ain't, I'm not, I'm going to Revelation. We're going to Revelation. Revelation 1. I don't, did I give it on this? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I will read it over you. Actually, you know what? There it is. The revelation, oh God, from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon. We don't have time. Who, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. The only disciple who wasn't martyred, he was boiled in oil and then sent to the island of Patmos and writes the book of Revelation, not Revelations. who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Stop, don't switch. Oh. <laughs> this next verse. <laughs> I am stealing this from a different pastor and I don't care. I'm stealing a blessing in front of you today. I am going to be blessed. The good news is so are you. Go ahead and put verse three up now. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Mm. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Don't amen yet. Oh. Revelation 3, verse 14. The church in Laodicea. Do we know this passage? <laughs> to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words <clears throat> of the amen. Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Oh, man. So, because you are lukewarm, America, 
Neither hot nor cold, America. I am about to spit you out of my mouth, America. Vomit, as the other translations say. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I'll skip to 19. Oh my gosh. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. We have heard this passage. Laodicea was uh, 10 miles away from where they would get water. Hot water that had medicinal properties. I think Cleopatra would swim in the water. They built pipes to bring that water to Laodicea. 10 miles. It was hot where it started. By the time it got to them, it was just warm. They needed hot water for health. The cold water would be refreshing. I've always read this, and I'm sure you have too. We look at it and we're like, oh, people should be on fire or not. But Jesus is using the illustration of the water. Be on fire for God or be cold, be refreshing. Is your Christianity refreshing to someone? But the water, when it got there, would be lukewarm. It would make them sick. It would make them throw up. This is the American church today. Now, listen. We're, we're all in this together. So this next part's probably going to hurt. Listen all the way through before you decide to stone me. The previous generation, before me, my gripe with you is that your generation quit pushing as hard for Jesus. You stopped. You gave up on your first love. And you raised a generation, my generation, with uh, your parents took you to church but you didn't want to push that on your kids stupid dumb I'm sorry I'm not that's dumb I don't want to push no we're not pushing religion you're saving your children from eternal damnation you got too focused on tradition that's why you're mad that I said pissed off. That's why you're mad that I have tattoos. That's why you're mad that I'm wearing joggers and a t-shirt. That's why you're mad that worship is too loud. That's why you're mad we're not singing hymns anymore. Where are the hymns? Guess what? Those were new too. And people didn't like them back then. Are we limiting God to just hymns? You have made an idol of hymns. An idol of hymns. As if God only birthed, oh my Lord. If we should only sing the old stuff, throw everything out and just read the Psalms for worship. He said sing a new song. Do you think he didn't want people to write more worship about him? Do you think he didn't want people to worship him in a different way, in a new way, a way that might they like a little bit better than the hymns? And there's nothing wrong with the hymns. I'm not against it. But so many people hate the new contemporary uh, Christian music. And you guys don't realize a lot of the people writing this new stuff grew up in the same churches that you went to. And they are writing the hymns into the new music. So the younger generation is still getting the hymns. But you're hung up on the guitars and the drums and the lights. The younger generation, my generation, you're not out of the water either. Because our parents, not necessarily mine since the pastor's kid, it didn't. 
It didn't. I had my walkabout. We grew up because you didn't push things on us. Because we had to make our own decision about the faith. We grew up now not knowing what to do, what to believe in. And we grew up completely lukewarm. And we're mixing sin and salvation. Don't talk about sexual immorality. I want Jesus and I still want to get smashed. I'm dialing back my heart with this language for y'all. But this is real. We're synchronizing stuff and we're like, oh, look, go look around. We've got Jesus and you're mixing tarot cards. We got Jesus and you're mixing crystals. We got Jesus and I'm praying to the universe. The universe didn't make you. God made the universe. And now we have a generation coming up behind us that literally does not know the name of Jesus. That should crush you. Should break you. Every, oh, every person you pass has a story. Do you ever walk or drive and you see every car and do you ever stop and think, do they know Jesus? Where are they going when they die? What are they going through? Do they know their Lord and Savior? And we have this generation that's coming up underneath us that doesn't know God. But we're content with coming in here. This is, this is not Christianity, okay? Listening to me speak, listening to him speak is not Christianity, Listening to this music is not Christianity. Reading your Bible is not Christianity. It is the relationship with your Lord and Savior. That is Christianity. Not the lights, not the sound, not the feelings. It is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. But we come in here... And we argue over titles, positions, songs, sound levels, lights, delivery, dress. We strain at gnats and we swallow camels. I don't like that song. That song's boring. Oh, pastor didn't speak to me today. His sermon was boring. Oh, he was yelling too much. I didn't like that. That wasn't really for me. We make it all about us. I didn't like that song. God did. I didn't like that sermon. God did. I didn't like that prayer. God did. This ain't about you. It ain't about me. It's about him. That's it. But we come in here and we get comfortable. America. And we have this generation coming up behind us that knows nothing. And I am praying, and you've got to pray too, for repentance to find these people before judgment does. Because it is coming. Christianity is dying. Dying. We are bleeding out. Dying. We are, we are spiritual squatters coming in church. And wanting nothing to do other than just coming in here and sitting. To inhabit a house that we don't want to contribute to. To inhabit a house that we don't want to work for. To inhabit a house that we don't want to serve at. We're spiritual squatters. Contributing nothing to the kingdom. And expecting everything in return. Spoiled rotten. God, we're so weak. We're so woke. This, do you know what the fastest growing religion is right now? Islam. I looked, oh. I looked this up before I came out this morning. And the projections by 2050 is for 40 million people to come to Christ. 
40 million people to come to Christianity. With 106 million leaving. Laodicea in, in Turkey. <laughs> Jesus wasn't white. For some of y'all that think he was white. Began over there. It started over there. And what is there now? Ruins. Rubble. Rubble. I watched a message of the remains of the church of Laodicea and the steps were so tall that it wasn't like American steps where you can just move up and down in cadence. You had to lift yourself and strain to get there so that as you were walking up the steps, your head would connect with where you are going. You're posturing your heart with where you are going. But we just come to church and we're comfortable and where the birthplace of Christianity was and where Paul wrote his letters is now overwhelmingly and increasingly Islamic. We're dying. You remember when Hamas attacked Israel and people were protesting here against Israel, pro-Hamas here? Listen to me. If they came after, oh, 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 oh. oh bring it. Jew, Jew, Jewish Jews, I don't know what word I'm looking for. The, the Jews, it's like the parent of Christianity. We came out of that. And they, they attack and they come after the Jews. Who is next? Us. And we're comfortable with being here because the seats feel good because the air conditioning is good we're dying we're dying I uh, you read about the great falling away and so I don't know if you're like me my head was always like okay well that's we just think about our surrounding area and we're like well that's not here look at the world Christianity is all but dead over there and it's coming over here. We're next. What are you going to do when we can't meet here? What are you going to do when we have to try to hide to survive? What are you going to do when they outlaw reading the Bible? When they outlaw praying? What are you going to do? Because there's people over there that get guns put to their head and they say, Deny Jesus and maybe we'll let you live. Maybe. Choose your heart. Choose your heart. Are you going to fear man who can kill your body and shut you down? Are you going to fear God who is seated at the right hand, or Jesus who is seated at the right hand of God who is going to intercede for you on judgment day? But if you, can, if you deny him... He will deny you. What are you going to do? Let's be real. There's probably... We say that. We say that. We say that. I won't do it. When it comes to your door... And they put a gun to your child's head. And they say, deny Jesus. What are you going to do? They can kill your mortal body. They can take you out of this earth. But there is only one person who is controlling your existence and eternity. So if you stand for him, he will stand for you. And you will be accepted into heaven. You will have a crown in heaven. Let them kill you. This is temporary. And the, the, oh, the depressing part is I'm going to sit here and scream this at you. And if it happened, some of you would still not do it. You say that. Oh, let them kill us. You don't know what that's going to look like, but it's headed here. It's headed here. It's already here. It's already starting. This is why I'm like, hey, you guys, you've got to invite someone to church. We're losing. 
This is, uh, it's going to happen, period, okay? There will, we, we can have a revival, and we can stir people up. It's still going to happen. That's just how it's going to play out. There is the great falling away. What you need to decide on, are you on the train out of here? Are you going to get more people on the train with you out of here? Or when you hear the trumpet sound, are you going to be looking up and going, oh, shoot. Probably saying a different word. Y'all, is, is this real? It burns in me. What are we doing? We're comfortable in here. We're comfortable. And I'm like, hey, we need, we need money to help give to the homeless. Hey, we need money to help build a bigger building so we can bring, bring people in here so we can continue the ministry. Hey, we need people to serve because Children's Church gets upset if I preach too long and they don't have enough people serving in there. Hey, the production team is empty and Tanya, who's supposed to be singing, is helping run a camera. Hey, we need people who know how to run sound. Hey, we need people who know how to run lights. Hey, we need people to serve. And that's the response we get. You want to tell me in this room, none of y'all know how to play an instrument or sing. You're going to tell me in this room that no one in this room has a skill that they can contribute to the kingdom of God and the expansion of the gospel. The expansion will, be, uh, will, become, will come after this because of exposure. That's what today is, exposure. And now that you have been exposed, you cannot hide it anymore. Oh, I feel like Elijah. Choose this day who you will serve. It's important. And we get so excited. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Why are we not warning other people? Oh, because we're mad. I'm going to really make you mad. Guess what? God loves, loves, not loved, loves Hitler as much as he loves you. God loves, I read about a doctor that's got seven, he just got arrested for 17,000 videos and four hard drives with every age, every gender. And guess what? God loves him as much as he loves you. You don't like that because you want levels. Oh, I just, I, you know, I just, I, I cussed on the way here. I'm not as bad as somebody that's out there being a pedophile. I'm not as bad as somebody that's out there raping someone. I'm not as bad as somebody that's out there murdering someone. I'm not as bad. Sin is an even ground. And we're all on it. It's serious. This is serious. And I need you guys to... I understand. It's serious. This is, ser- this is not just come in and feel good and clap and shout and leave. Oh, church was awesome. I don't want you to leave today. Oh, church was awesome. I want you to leave today saying, I've, I've got something I need to do. I've got something I need to do. This is serious. Does my family know about Jesus? Do my friends know about Jesus? Do they? Are you going to be in the line in heaven and look over and they're standing there looking at you going, what happened? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? That's heavy. That's so heavy. Because here, I can warn you, you can go change. When we get to that point, that's it. And we don't think about that because all we're thinking is, man, he's going long again today. I'm hungry. This is nothing compared to eternity. Nothing. We've got so much work to do. So much. We're starving. We're starving for God. That's why when you, you preach stuff like this, it either clears the building or it fills the building. Because we're so starved for truth. And the problem is, since we we don't know the word of God, 
We go online and we see stupid stuff on TikTok like, oh, Jesus didn't exist because, you know, the letter J wasn't invented until the 1500s. It's, it's an English translation, dude. It's, it, y'all laugh, but this is real. There's people online misleading millions of people with this false doctrine like that. That's the severity of it. And, and oh my Lord, all of you have a platform. In Newsflash, the disciples, oh, they would kill to have the platform that you have, to have the power that you have. You have the power of the Holy Spirit within you and you have social media. You can post anything and unless TikTok takes it down, somebody can see it. Somebody can get the seed of the gospel. Somebody can see it and somebody can get saved and they can see you in heaven and say, thank you for telling me that I was a sinner. We've got so much work to do, but we're so starved for God's word that we don't know truth when we see it or when we hear it. And that's why we see all of these people saying this junk online and people just flock into it. They don't test it. They don't test anything. The Bible says test the apostles. And we hear about somebody, oh, they're apostle so-and-so. Test them. Test them. Test them. Do they hold up against the mighty and the majestic and the reverent word of God? Do they stand or do they crumble because they want a title? I got to wrap this up. I could, I could do this all day, apparently. <laughs> One more. You know what? Let me, let, me, let me show you something. Revelation 21. 21. Are you brave? I guess not. Okay. Are you brave? Are you bold? Are you bo- Come on, shout it. Are you brave or not? You got the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead of you. Shout that stuff. Be bold, man. You afraid to shout? You'll yell at your kids. But I'm like, hey, praise God. Show them your boldness. Like we're golfing in here. Are you bold or are you a coward? You know who Jesus calls cowards? My reckon some of y'all's theology because you don't think Jesus views people as cowards. Look at verse 8. Did I give them that? I I put so much scripture in there. I don't even know what I gave them. (laughs) Amen. Y'all, I love you guys. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. That's all of us. There is something in that list that was you, that might still be you. And I am exposing you and I am exposing it today. That was us without Jesus. That was us without Jesus. And that is everyone without Jesus. Cowards, are you bold or not? Are you bold or not? Then do something with it. Go out today, share something. People need your testimony. You went through something that should have killed you, that should have broken you. But God lifted you up out of that. And he said, now go and use it. It wasn't for nothing. Go and use it. Go invite someone.
going to church. Go tell somebody what you've been through. Go tell them how your family dealt with this and you're going to be the one to break it off so your kids won't. Go do something with it. Quit just coming in here and listen to us shout at you. This, that's the thing with American Christianity. We think it's, this, my job is to do your walk for you. Right. You're like the virgins with the wicks that have no oil. Right. And the day comes, and you're going to be like, well, give me some of yours. I need some, I need some oil. He's here. I'm going to say, you should have brought it with you. You should have already had it. I told you what to do. I warned you. I kept screaming at you. Do something with your life. Do something with your Christianity. Do something with the walk of God. Do something with what I'm telling you to do. Do something. And we just, man, that was a good word today. It's great. And nothing changes. And we go six days as if this could feed us. This is not Christianity. This is fuel for your walk. This is so we can come together and be empowered, to be encouraged, to be enlightened to who God is, to experience him together as a community and then go out into the world and do something with it. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. That's not my job for you. That's all of y'all's job. Who are you bringing in? Who are you bringing in? Who's going to be seated at the table with you in eternity and say just thank you? Thank you. You broke my heart and you crushed me and I was bitter and I was angry because you pointed out my sin and it made me feel horrible about myself. But thank you. Thank you. We don't know how good we've got it until it's gone. And let me tell you, it's going to be gone. It's coming here. It's already here. But we're just stuck in the cycle of this is what we do. And we come to church and nothing changes. And it's all about our feelings instead of our faith. Faith is not a feeling. It doesn't feel good to follow God sometimes. You think it felt good when Daniel was in the lion's den? Do you think it felt good when David, you guys can come up. If if you don't come up, I'm going to keep going. You think it felt good to lose his child after the affair? Jesus asked God three times to take the cup away. Do you think it felt good to be beaten and spit on and brutally destroyed? And the worst part is hanging on the cross and feeling the distance from God. Does that connect in your mind? Like, oh my Lord, how brutal and how horrible the crucifixion was but when did he say my God why have you forsaken me why have you forsaken me (laughs) teenagers that's what you get for not bringing a new battery this morning he says it on the cross not because (laughs) the pain because the distance he felt from the weight of feeling my sin, the weight of feeling your sin and your sin and your sin, that is what he felt being forsaken. Heaven is eternity with God and hell is eternity without weeping, gnashing of teeth, begging for mercy, but there is no mercy because God is not there. Begging for water, but there is no water because God is not there. Do you see? We need to be broken.
broken. All this week, and I, oh, I'm telling you, pray it over your life. I know it's scary and it's going to hurt, but it's been my prayer for several weeks and things have happened. <laughs> things have happened and it feels heavy, but you realize I prayed for this and I, I need this. I need to die to myself. You need to die to yourself, to deny yourself, to take up your cross, crucify your flesh. That doesn't sound fun. What's more fun, playing PlayStation or reading the Bible? Why do you think there's so much stuff to distract us? And I'm not saying don't do that stuff. I love playing games with my kids. But this has to take precedence over your life. It's, it's seek first the kingdom of God. But we don't. We seek it last and then we're like, God, my life is horrible right now. Please help me. We bring a, a laundry list and a grocery list to God. I need this. I want that. I need this. We think our Christianity is our stuff. And we're not like, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, but thank you for my wife. Thank you for dying for me, but thank you for my family. Thank you for dying for me, but thank you for my house. Thank you for dying for me, but thank you for my kids. Thank you for dying for me, but thank you for my family. Thank you for dying for me, but thank you for my house. Thank you for my car. But we don't start like that. We're like, God, I, I need this. I, I want a new house. I need money. Please let me win the lottery. If you let me win the lottery, I'm going to give more to the church and then we'll have it be that big building. Wrong. If you won't do it now, you ain't going to do it when you got a whole lot more zeros to put. It's going to give you that much more indigestion. I have no idea if I laid the foundation for the coming weeks or not. Um, but we need, a, we need a renewal. We need a renewal. Thank you. Sorry for taking way more. I don't even know. I'm way over the clock. I'm not sorry. It's just I want to make you feel like I'm sorry, but I'm not. put some reels on there later. <laughs> the last thing I have written down before I came out of here was a charge to you, to us as a body. Y'all know the drill. They're going to play. You can turn the lights down. Play me out of here. Get me out of here. <sighs> the last thing I wrote was a charge to you and a charge to me. Because we can shout about it, we can talk about it, but until we apply it and put it in an application, nothing changes. Nothing changes. And we fool ourselves into thinking that God is working through us and as soon as we leave the door, we forget about it. we got four weeks we're going to spend in this. Second Chronicles. Today was 17. We got 18, 19, and 20. Go read it. Saturate yourself in it. Come expecting to hear from God because we need to be committed. We have to make a change. And my charge to you, my charge, what camera are we on? My charge to TikTok who's not there anymore. And YouTube and Facebook, my charge to us as the body of Christ, not just this church, what is it going to look like to go out and do something? I had a vision 
What is it going to look like to just go downtown and pray over people? And as they're walking by, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? If they say no, let them walk. Pray for them anyways. They're going to shout at you. You're going to get nasty reactions. They're going to spit on you. They're going to cuss you out. Because the demons. You could speak any other name. This is why when you go to these, like the, 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 the trans events and all that stuff, as soon as you say Jesus, people are hissing and getting angry and their faces contort. That's the demons manifesting within them, rejecting them. But if you ever watch videos of these people, you'll see that their body still stands there and eventually they shut up because something God has imprinted in our hearts. Oh, oh my Lord. I just got reminded of this. The Bible, a few more minutes. I'm sorry, not sorry. The Bible talks about how God has stamped his name on Jerusalem. And if you look at an overhead map, it's there. It's, it's stamped. It's the same Hebrew letter. And the more fun part is, it's the same shape that's in your heart. It's all. God is all within us. He's put himself there. And it's our sinful nature that wants to reject him and turn away from him. But it's, he is literally within us. He knows the number of hair on your head. Even if you're bald, he still knows the number of fuzz that ran away. <laughs> and if he cares about something as, oh man, if he cares about something as insignificant as that, something we devote so much time and money to getting haircuts and hair products and getting our nails done and making sure we look pretty to come to church on Sunday. God, what does he think about your soul? To commune with him, not just there, but here. We've settled for, oh, I'm saved, and, you know, I'm just looking forward to heaven. Do something here. Bring heaven here. Bring heaven here. Oh, Lord. All right. I charge you, do something with this. Go somewhere. If you don't want to go downtown, go drive by people and pray for them. As you're at work, pray for them. I don't care if they stole your idea and took it to the boss and they got your promotion instead. Pray double for them. Amen. Pray they get another promotion. Because you get out of the way of yourself and you pray for their blessing, you're going to have a whole lot bigger one coming your way. We're exposed. We're exposed. You are now exposed. You cannot stuff it back in a box if you stay the entire way. You're now like naked before God. You can't hide it anymore. It's time to do something with it. People are dying. Christianity is dying. Are we just going to accept it? Or are we going to do something about it and try to save some more people and wake people up? Let's do something about it, guys. worship. Quit thinking about how your voice sounds or how it looks if you raise your hand. Did you put deodorant on this morning? And worship your creator. Thank him for what he has given you. Thank him for just being 
being there, that you're not there on your own. Because he's in it with you. Working through you. Fighting for you. God is not against you. And if you need prayer, I would love to pray with you. And there will be others at this altar to pray with you, but we need to lay ourselves bare. Come and be broken. Pray for brokenness so you can be restored to better. Prepare to be repaired. Prepare to be repaired. Father, I I thank you so much. We need revival. America needs revival. And let it fall apart with not at least standing up and saying something. And I challenge these people, God, that you break them and anoint them for their task. Let us never be the same when we walk out of here. Break us, God, and mold us into who we need to be. And give yourself back to this country. Put yourself back at the center. Don't let it die here. Don't just let revival come, God. Renew us. Help us to stay committed. Help us to follow you. Help us to obey you. To just step out and do it. Quit waiting for the experience to come and just get the experience as we do it. God, help us. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.